So today we're, we're starting a, a moral theory called hedonism. And we're looking at this today through two ancient philosophers and their schools. Uh, next week we're going to start two weeks where we look at a particular variety of hedonism called utilitarianism that introduces another twist to it. And that's going to be Bentham and Mill. But today we're looking at the ancient proponents of it. So we're looking at this guy Aristippus and his Cyrenaic school, and then we're looking at Epicurus, who started you know, the whole Epicurean tradition. Uh, what do all these, these guys have in common? They're all hedonists. And to be a hedonist means to think that pleasure is the fundamental good. Um, sometimes we use that term today pejoratively. We say if somebody's a hedonist, we mean that they're just devoted to pleasure, and we probably mean that they, they make a lot of bad choices you know, as a result by sacrificing all sorts of other things directly for pleasure. That's not necessarily what a hedonist would do, but some hedonists are like that, right? So this whole notion of eat, drink, and be merry, as the Shakespeare quote goes, because tomorrow we're going to die, that would be a, a hedonistic way of approaching things. Um, and one way of thinking about hedonism, we use this intrinsic and, and instrumental uh, good distinction a few class sessions ago, if you're a hedonist, then all the other good things, and you can recognize other things as good things, but all other good things are merely, in, are merely instrumental goods to get yourself what really matters, the intrinsic good of pleasure. Um, that's what makes you a hedonist. To say that pleasure is the good, the fundamental good, is equivalent to saying that all other goods are instrumental. So a friendship, friendships are good things. But why are they good for hedonists? Because they bring pleasure in one way or another. Maybe you like hanging out with your friend, they're enjoyable, or maybe you get things from your friend, you don't really like your friend that much, but you know you get things that are pleasurable from them, they would be an instrumental good. We talked about this last time that we brought up this distinction, right? Um, why do people like food, drink, wine, stuff like that? Because of the pleasure that why do we like watching TV? Because it gives us pleasure of one form or another. So there's a lot of different kinds of pleasures, but ultimately they would be the only things that are truly valuable. Everything else would be valuable just because they lead to it. And if you could get the pleasure directly, why not cut out the, the instrumental thing? You know? Or if you have to sacrifice something, what are you going to sacrifice? You're not going to sacrifice the pleasure, you're going to sacrifice the other goods. So if a friendship gets in the way of your greater pleasure, sacrifice that friendship, right? If um, one pleasure that's lesser in intensity gets in the way of another pleasure, sacrifice that lesser pleasure for the, for the greater pleasure. That's what a hedonist would say. Um, so now if, if pleasure is the good, what would be the bad? What would be the evil? Exactly, yeah. So, if pleasure is the fundamental good, then experiencing pain would be the worst thing. Um, now, if you're a hedonist, that would mean that there would be other trade-offs, too, to get away from pain. Anything that you could do to lessen the amount of pain that you feel would be a good thing. That would also be an instrumental good. And there's a lot of things, again, we talked about this before, like medicine, right? Do you guys like taking medicine? Probably not. Why do you take it? Because it makes you feel less less awful when you're sick, right? Um, so we do some things in order to gain pleasure. We do other things in order to avoid pain or prevent pain or alleviate pain, and that's pretty much it from a hedonist perspective. That's the whole <coughs> moral universe. Everything fits into that. Um, now we're going to look at two different approaches to this, and they are quite distinct, and, and uh, they really do diverge from each other. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about these, these two guys and their schools uh, before we do that, so that might help you keep them apart in your mind. So Aristippus was another student of Socrates. Plato wasn't the only person who followed Socrates and then founded his own philosophical school. There were a number of different people who did that, and then some other people did other things, like uh, Xenophon was a historian, 
who was also a military officer. Um, also, the by <coughs> Alcibiades was sort of a student of Socrates who managed to screw up Greek politics for at least a couple generations. He wasn't a philosopher. Um, Aristippus was a philosopher, and he was kind of a rich guy. Um, and he focused primarily on pleasure, on living a life that was as pleasant as possible. That's the message that he got from Socrates. That was the good life. So he must have been, you know, hearing very, very different things than Plato in some respects, right? Because um, that's not Plato's message. But um, that's what Aristippus came up with. And then he founded a school, and it's called the Cyrenaic School. Why? Because it um, was in Syria, the, the, the location. And this school continued for a long time. It was a major school in ancient thought, and they were all hedonists. They said, pleasure is the fundamental good. So you should live a life devoted to pleasure and avoiding pain. Um, Epicurus is coming a bit later. He is uh, closer in time to Plato's student, Aristotle. So you're, you're looking at a difference of a couple generations. And Epicurus um, founded another major school of philosophy. Some people thought that he was associated with Aristippus, but he's really quite different. Um, and here's the fundamental difference between the two of them. Aristippus is going to say that physical pleasure is more intense, is better than mental pleasure, or pleasures of the soul, or however you want to figure it. And if that's the case, then what should we pursue? We should pursue physical pleasure, right? And if we have to sacrifice mental pleasure for physical pleasure, we should take the physical pleasure. And if we have a chance to pursue it directly, why not do that? He, you know, Aristippus was actually criticized in a, in a quote that I give you for hanging around with prostitutes and, and you know, taking them in and living with them and things like that. And Ar Aristippus said, you know, if you want pleasure directly, this is one really good way to do it. I don't have to go through all the hoops that other people have to go through in order to satisfy my you know, sexual desires. I can take care of it right away, and then I can experience some other pleasures. Um, he was being consistent with his, his philosophical viewpoint. A lot of people you know, looked, looked at that as a bad thing, but that's because they had other moral theories. There's no way Epicurus would have said anything like that. Why? Because Epicurus thought that mental pleasures and alleviation of mental pains was much better than physical pleasures or alleviation of physical pains. So with Aristippus, you've got one kind of hedonism. With Epicurus, you have another kind of hedonism. Um, but they're both hedonist in that they think that pleasure is the fundamental good. It's just what kind of pleasure are you going to make your life center around? And so this is a good point to like think about these questions that you remember back a couple class sessions ago, who asked these questions, who raised them. First reading that you had was who? Socrates. It wasn't Socrates, that was later on. Uh, Euclid. Say again? Euclid, was it? No? McIntyre. McIntyre, yeah. A Mac guy, right? <laughs> um, all those, those, those Scots, you know. Um, yeah, it was, it was McIntyre. McIntyre said, every moral theory is asking these two fundamental questions, as well as other questions, and every human being in the course of their life asks these in a very specific way. Um, what is the good for human beings? Well, hedonism says pleasure. Another way to think about this, if you want to broaden it further, is... Happiness. The hedonist wants to be happy. They have a particular conception of what happiness consists of. This is where Epicurus and Epictetus are going to be different from each other. Happiness for, all right, not Epicurus and Epictetus, sorry. Epicurus and Aristippus. Um, Epictetus is somebody you're going to read later on. Um, Aristippus thinks that happiness consists in one particular way of experiencing pleasures. Epicurus thinks it's a different way. So once you've got that figured out, that doesn't solve everything for you then, right? You have to ask this other question. 
okay, I know what the good is. I've got that straight. How do I get it? What do I have to do in order to be happy then? And this is a question about how you arrange your life, how you weigh things against each other, how you value things, what sacrifices you make, what you pursue, what you reject. Um, this is where it gets down to the more nitty gritty, right? It's one thing to know what you ought to pursue. It's a whole different thing to figure out how you're going to get there. And these two are going to differ on that as well, in part because they have different conceptions of happiness. So before we actually go into each of their, their ideas, let's, um, let's look at some of these um, pleasures or pleasant experiences that you guys had over the weekend. <coughs> and I'll start out by telling you about something that I found particularly pleasant uh, yesterday. Pleasant experience. Um, just in part to, to help you see what, I, what I'm driving at this. So yesterday I went to the girls' basketball game. Um, it was faculty appreciation night, so they sent us emails. They said, you can get free tickets. And I thought, yeah, that could be fun. You know, Maris is a, a good school for athletics, so there's probably a good chance that, you know, they'll, they'll play well. Um, haven't been to a basketball game for a long time. I don't like watching basketball on TV. I find it very boring. But I do like watching it in the stands in, in person. And you can get two tickets. Um, I probably wouldn't have gone by myself anyway. But I went with my, my wife. Um, and it was sort of a, not even midweek, early week date night. Because one of the things that you have to really make sure that you do, you'll experience this when you're, when you're married, is um, during the courtship period, you have lots of dates, right? But then after a while, when you're married, you have to make sure that you actually make time for that sort of thing. So this was an ideal opportunity to do that. Uh, we both work all the time, and we thought this would be a, a good occasion to do that. So we went to the game, and it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. We went in, a lot of alumni, students, the band was playing, the band is really good. Um, and, uh, we got, we got situated, I went down, got some, got some, you know, I got Gatorade for me and a soda for, for, uh, for her, and then we sat and we watched the game, and it was a lot of fun, because, you know, first, the, the opposing team, the, what are they called, the uh, St. Peter's Peahens, um, <laughs> they're from Jersey, they, they came out and they started beating the Maris team, and they're like, oh god, this is, you know, this isn't going to be very good, and then Maris got, got into it, and they just trounced them. By the end of the game, they had like 80 points. The other team was in the 30s, I think. 80 and to 49. Oh, 49. Okay. Yeah. And they were, you know, they just played way better, and they, they had some really good blocks and and some some good, you know, uh, defense. And and it, I think it really helps to have home field advantage when you have a band like that that plays all these songs and actually heckles the other team uh, while they're doing it. And you know, they did the typical sort of things with having, you know, contests here and there. So a lot of spectacle stuff, right? And so it was very fun. I was there, you know, with my wife. We got to spend some time together um, doing something that we both enjoyed. So now let, let's think about this. What were, what were the pleasures involved with that? There wasn't just one pleasure, yeah. You got to spend time with your wife. Yeah, so there, that's an important part. Uh, friendship, companionship. Even perhaps a, you know, a sort of a developing intimacy or something like that, right? Yeah. It was free. Oh, I do like getting free things. And then there, <laughs> you know, nobody ever brought that up uh, when I when I mentioned this in the other class. I actually get a kick out of like bargains and stuff like that. So you're right. There is a pleasure that comes with that for me. I, I don't know if that would be for everybody, but yeah. Entertainment. Yeah, and, and more than one kind of entertainment, right? There's the spectacle of the game, the athletic contest. You get to see people who've been training, um, not only themselves and their bodies, but with, uh, with everybody else competing against each other. That's a lot of fun. That's why we like to watch, watch sports. Um, that's also why we like to watch things like American Idol. That's also competition, right? Yeah. 
there's like a sense of community, like because you have the outside community coming in, and then the Marist community. So yeah, and and the Marist alumni and um, students seem to be particularly good in that respect. It was a very enjoyable experience. Um, yeah. Say a little bit louder for me. Um, everybody in their game, obviously, the Marist people are experiencing a victory that they're Winning, yeah. Winning is pleasant. Losing is not pleasant, right? Um, so that, that's a, that's a, so we have a whole bunch of different pleasures all, all in there. What are some of the things that you enjoyed this, this weekend or, um, <coughs> yeah? Uh, I went home to watch this video with my dad. Okay, yeah, a lot of people said Super Bowl parties. Or, do you watch it just with your dad? I don't know. Oh, it's with family. I watched it with, with, with uh, just my wife. We didn't go to a party or anything like that. Um, so, Super Bowl parties, what else? Yeah. I went to the Syracuse game in Madison Square Garden. Okay. Friend from high school. Okay. Visit. Um, um, one more. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and what did you do there? Um, I went with one of my friends from home. Okay. Atlantic City was a with friends because that. So let's think about what's what's pleasant about these things. What's enjoyable about this? What are the components of it? So Super Bowl parties with your family or with friends, <coughs> you do have a kind of friendship, right? Going on. No, we can probably <coughs> list that for almost all of these. Uh, what else? Yeah, it might be might be um, drinking. Which is enjoyable, otherwise people wouldn't do it, right? Uh, yeah. I would say like the atmosphere, like nobody is really, everybody's like carefree at a party usually. Okay. Uh, am I spelling this right? I'm for E, right? Lesion. I'm not sure how you spell it, but <laughs> that, that is exactly what I meant. <laughs> yeah, being able to relax, enjoy yourself. Um, well, at least while the Super Bowl is going on, you're not thinking about it. Homework you have to do, the stuff I need to put in the I learn, you know. What else? What else do people have at Super Bowl parties that makes it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, and the be it's better if you have a, a wide variety, right? And, you know, you don't want to be the person who just brings the bag of Doritos. You know, you want you want to have a, I mean, not, not that Doritos are necessarily bad. I like them, but you know, wings, dip. Um, what else? Do, we had brats because you know we're from Wisconsin. What else do people have? Pizza. Pizza. Yeah, that would be that would be good. Oreo. We had some Oreo truffles. Oreo truffles. Wow, that's that's pretty good too. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have all we had was savory. We didn't have any sweet desserts. Um, but I suppose yeah, you could bring a whole bunch of sweet desserts as well. Imagine what the what the um, Super Bowl parties that the people at the culinary must have. What kind of snacks they have? Probably should try to crash one of those sometime. Yeah. Um, so this is quite a few different pleasures. Um, what about going to a game at Madison Square Garden? Um, there's probably a lot of similar things, right? Which components would fit in there? Friendship. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, what else about the game though? Too. There's watching the actual game. Watching the Giants one. Yeah, I guess for most of you, this it would be the, the enjoyment of victory, right? Uh, but then there's just the uh, entertainment value. And the uh, Pat's pants. <laughs> oh, you're okay. You're, you're, oh, no, no. I was just saying. <laughs> it's okay if you are. And then there is. I don't have a dog in this fight, right? You know, I'm, I'm a Packers fan, so I don't care. <laughs> I, I rooted for the Giants myself, but that's because, you know, NFC versus AFC, so. Um, Plus, no one really likes 
I, I don't know why. You know, I'm not from here, so. <laughs> but you're right, nobody does. They're sort of like the cowboys of the, uh, the AFC. You know, everybody hates the cowboys in the NFC. Um, so back to Syracuse. So the same stuff pretty much as the Super Bowl party, you think, or anything different? Any uh, additional? The, um, I don't know what word you could use, but just the environment of being at Madison Square Garden, just like the big stage. I think you're big right. Lights. Let's call that um, atmosphere. You know, one of the things that somebody else brought up was um, having a nice uh, meal at a restaurant with somebody. And I said, you know, you, you pay for atmosphere. You don't just pay for the food itself. You pay for how it's plated, the music that's around, the, the look of the place, the feel of the place, the servers, the rhythm. You're paying for all those sorts of things because we find those enjoyable. Um, you had your hand first. Yeah, I was going to say, um, like the escape, escaping for like the day at Madison Square Garden, the game. I mean, that's not oh. that for me. Yeah, uh, that would uh, be like these, I think, right? Getting, getting away from things. But maybe changing location uh, is something that we find enjoyable. Getting away from the house, getting away from the apartment, getting away from the same town. Yeah. Um, what you're saying about atmosphere, I, think, I feel like changing location is kind of the same thing because earlier you were like, you hate watching basketball on TV, but you like going to a game. Like, yeah. I hate baseball. I don't hate baseball. I'm not a big baseball fan. <coughs> I can't watch it on TV, but if somebody says, do you want to go to like Yankee Stadium, it, there's, it's game, like an I'll drop everything and go. Yeah, it's, it, I, I'm the same way. I can't stand it on TV. It's the most boring thing uh, because it's so slow. But if you're there in the stands and, you know, there's all, you're surrounded by all these other people that are watching the game, and there's, you know, the hot dogs and, and all this other stuff, and, you know, the nice open air. There's something to that experience and that, that we find that pleasant, right? There may be some things we also find painful, like, you know, sitting on the bench for a long time. But, uh, I don't know, Yankee Stadium or something, but... Um, they got benches, too. Do they? Yeah. Um, what about visiting your friend from high school? I think there's probably some elements to that that are <coughs> different than seen so far. So visiting a friend from high school, you have the friendship aspect, definitely there. What else? What else is pleasant about that? Yeah. It's kind of like, I feel like when you visit back home, it's mm -hmm. kind of like all the good memories that you've had about that come back to you. So I don't know how to exactly okay. explain that. Good associations. Um, so yeah. you, you expect good out of it, basically. When you share common experiences, common, uh, uh, even common language. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I don't know if I, did I ever tell you about this story <clears throat> when when my now wife and I first talked on the phone? Did I tell you guys about that? So we're from about 20 miles apart in Wisconsin. But we went to the same high school. That's where we actually met. Um, I was, it was my sophomore year and it was her freshman. Um, and we never dated in high school, and then we sort of parted ways, and then we both worked in the same office building about five years afterwards in Milwaukee, third shift, uh, actually flirted with each other, didn't realize who each other were, we were both dating other people at the same time, so of course nothing ever happened. And then uh, much, much, much later on, 15 years after that, we end up uh, reconnecting, and we did it at first entirely through text. We didn't, we didn't talk to each other on the phone. We um, first used Facebook, and you know, we, the message function in Facebook, we actually broke that. Um, there's a certain limit for words, and if you go beyond that, they cut you off. They assume that you're spamming or stalking the other person. Well, you know, we were writing back and forth because we, we were infatuated with each other. You know, you know what it's like, right? And, um, so we were writing back and forth all the time. So that, that we couldn't do that anymore. And I remember the feeling that came with that when I realized we couldn't write to each other anymore because Facebook had like, you know, gotten the wrong message. And then she was really smart. She created a, a private blog that we could use to write as much as we wanted to each other. And then we started doing Google Chat because that was real time. We still haven't talked to each other on the phone. And then finally, um, one day, St. Patrick's Day, a couple years ago, um, she texted me, oh, we were texting, of course, 
and, and she, she said, um, what do you think about talking? You know, like actually talking. And so I said, yeah, okay, let's, let's do that. Well, and we were both so nervous that we, we set up a time, so it's you know, like a phone date, right? We set up a time and we both made sure that we had something to do with our hands. So we both had like a dish that we were preparing while we were talking on the phone. Now, as soon as I talked to her, and I heard that Wisconsin accent, it was like home. And, you know, it, it just it hit me. And there was something different about that than all the other stuff that we'd done up until that point. So that's, it's very difficult to put that in words, I think. It's, it's difficult to communicate exactly what that pleasure is. But that's an intense pleasure, isn't it? I think all of you know that. There's some place that for you is home. And there are people that, that signify that. Yeah, um, and that's something that we find pleasant. The older that you get, the more pleasant you'll find reminiscing, believe it or not, too. That's why old people talk about the past, because they've got an awful lot more of it. You know? um, anything else that would be particularly pleasant that, that we don't already have? I mean, you might have a drink with your friend, you might eat a meal with them. Um, that's probably, you probably nailed it. I'm going to Atlantic City with your friends. What, what else would be in there besides good food and drink, friendship, getting away from things? Maybe you see a show. I don't know. Um, well, I went with like my friends from high school, like my girlfriends from high school. But one of the girls, it was like her twenty-first birthday, so she brought all her. She lived in like a different neighborhood than me, so she brought all her friends. Like I guess me. Okay, that's a good. Um, Additional thing, meeting new people. Some not everybody likes that, right? Some people are kind of shy. They they don't like meeting new people. Um, other people, um, I'm guessing yourself, myself, enjoy meeting new people. You know, finding out who they are, where they come from, what makes them tick. I probably ask people too many questions myself, um, but I, I I like people. I want to know, you know, what, who they are and what's going on. Um, that's a pleasure for, for those who, who like that. Other people, you know, if you have social anxiety disorder, that, that one's not for you, right? Um, what else might you do in Atlantic City that would be pleasurable? Gamble. What's that? Gamble. Yeah, I think that's one of the big reasons people go. You'd probably do but, but let's put it down anyway, right? Um, you know, why do people like gambling? Well, you know, it, it's kind of risky. Right? It, it, you get a kind of charge out of doing it. I, I don't like it myself because I always lose. What's that? Yeah, I, uh, I find the losing money and losing the game more painful than the enjoyment of gambling. So you notice there's a trade off there, right? But a lot of people do pretty good. And, and some people actually just they enjoy the gambling so much they don't care if they lose. You know? uh, and some people can set themselves limits, like I'll go in. I'm not saying I, I'm saying somebody else. They'll say, I'll go in and I'll spend 100 bucks, and once I get through that, I'm, I'm done. And they'll just have their fun, yeah. And my now brother-in-law's uh, bachelor party, we went to uh, out, in, out in Philadelphia, or out in Pennsylvania, and gambled, and like, his brother, like, they gamble like every other weekend. So they have it down to like the park, so yeah. I guess. It, it's kind of just like a, it's just, it's a hobby at some point where some people don't like to do it because it's every once in a while and they yeah. always lose. Where if it's a hobby, I guess you enjoy it. I have a friend like that. She's a, she's a philosopher and she has a dad who's a professional gambler and she knows how to count cards. Mm -hmm. And so she goes in, she's actually been kicked out of like a, a casino before because they caught her counting cards. Um, she goes in and she plays blackjack and she makes money. The thing is, for me, that would like take away some of the enjoyment, just because you'd actually like have to be paying attention all the time, <laughs> right? And I, if I go and I'm going to do something like that, I don't have to be paying attention all the time and counting things. I guess once you get really good at it, you just sort of do it mentally, right? Um, but it, there are different pleasures for different people. Now, notice, look at all these different pleasures that we've already laid out with just a few experiences. How? Heterogeneous, how, how wide a range of pleasures we, we have here. 
Um, which of these are purely physical pleasures and which are much more mental pleasures? Um, and, and, you know, we could quibble about something like this, like, you know, like let's say we take drinking, right? Drinking is primarily a physical pleasure. There may be some mental aspects to it if you're a wine connoisseur, you know, and you're, you're testing your knowledge or something like that. Sure, there could be some, some mental aspects. You're studying the wine. But for the most part, why do we drink? Because we like drinking. We like to drink. We like the taste. People like the effect of the alcohol. Um, it could contribute to other pleasures, like, you know, you drink to socialize. Food is primarily a physical one, right? We eat because we, we enjoy the taste. It may not just be gustatory, it may be olfactory, you know, our, our, our sense of smell is tied in. It could be tactile, the way it feels. Um, it could be visual, you know, a good presentation, something like that. Um, like, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, that, that famous photograph of the McDonald's. Um, it's been going around on the internet, uh, the pink substance that, that apparently <coughs> Chicken McNuggets used to be made out of. Um, pretty gross. But if you actually saw a picture of that next to the food when you were consuming it, you would probably say, I don't want to eat this. You kind of grossed out. But, you know, if you don't have that, then it tastes pretty good. It's quite okay. Entertainment, like if you're watching the, the Super Bowl, that's uh, probably pretty physical, right? Um, what about the feeling of victory? Is that primarily a physical thing, or is that more of a mental thing? Yeah. Well, it depends if you're playing or not, and if you're not, how emotionally invested you are. Yeah. I can see with the, if you're playing or not. How much you're invested would determine, I guess, how intense it is for you. But would it would it determine whether it's a, primarily a physical pleasure or a mental pleasure? I'm not sure. Um, but even if you're playing, I mean, there, there's 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 physical activity and that's pleasurable, right? Especially if you're in good shape and your team is all working together as one. But there's something beyond the physical. That you know, attaining victory is, is. You're right. There's a physical element to it, but it's more something that we feel in our minds. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, if if you're the player, victory for you is more than just the win in itself. It's all your hard work paying off. Oh, sort of a so sense, that, sense of satisfaction. Right. So you get satisfied mentally by your hard work, and if you're like a spectator, like a fan, yeah, you're mentally. Uh, basically happy yeah, about right. it because hey this is my team and that's my time I watch them all the time I come here and I pay money and I'm glad they're actually winning you know what I mean yeah uh, an experience that some teams fans are often deprived of unfortunately yeah, if you're um, like a Mets fan or something yeah I don't know, Browns fan you know um, what about friendship think about that I mean, there, there could be physical components to it. You gotta, you know, you gotta actually like talk with the person, and that helps to be face to face, or at least on the phone. But your friendship is something more in the mind than it is in the body. I mean, you might do physical things with your friends, like you know, get together and you know, you wrestle with them or something like that. Who knows? You know, um, some friendships are, are romantic, you know, and, and they may lead to something physical too. Um, but there, you're talking about a different kind of pleasure, aren't you? Some pleasures are mental. Some pleasures, atmosphere. I mean, it's physical elements again, right? They arrange physical space, but it's it's maybe the emotional, the aesthetic effect on you that you care about. Um, and we don't have to make a rigid distinction between these, you know, and figure out exactly which ones. I just want you to see that, first of all, there's an awful lot of different kinds of pleasures we feel, and second, that we can make a distinction between um, primarily physical and primarily mental. The reason I want to be able to make that is um, these two guys, Epicurus and, Epi Epicurus and Aristippus, um, one favors one kind of pleasure or pain, one favors the other. So if you look at Aristippus, He 
says that physical pleasures or pains are more intense on the whole than mental pains. So think, for example, about a trade-off that he made having to do with physical pleasure and mental pains. I brought up the fact that people, you know, made fun of him and criticized him because of hanging around with prostitutes. Uh, and his answer was, um, <coughs> why do people hang around with prostitutes? It's not just for the, you know, pleasure of their conversation. It's to have sex with them, ultimately, right? Otherwise, we call them something different. Um, so sexual pleasure, that's particularly intense. What would, what would come with that? I mean, you could, you could think of something you might have to spend in order to, to get that. Uh, money, right? Spend money. And maybe that's a little bit of pain or lack of pleasure, because he could be spending the money on something also pleasant for himself, like um, you know, a whole bunch of candy bars, or a small portion of a new car, or you know, a ticket to a game, or something like that, right? Or taking his friends out to dinner. Um, so there, there's some pleasure that has to be foregone for that, but it's in order to experience a much greater pleasure. Um, what else is going on there? People are criticizing him, right? So how should that make him feel? Yeah. Well, to him, even though it may potentially he may not like it, it's okay because he's getting the more intense physical pleasure, which is better, which is the sexual pleasure. Yeah. <clears throat> but what, what, what pain would he be experiencing? If we want to lay this all out. People are criticizing him. How do you feel when people criticize you? Yeah. You're very self-conscious. Okay, so let, let's call it self-conscious. Um, um, or he feels a sense of shame. And that's a, here's a physical pleasure. Here's a mental pain. Um, and that's not as intense, he says. Mental pleasures, you know, mental pains are not as bad. So, you know, if pursuing a particular pleasure is shameful, but it's really an awful lot of pleasure, then it's a good trade-off. You have to sacrifice people liking you, but who cares? That's not that big of a pleasure compared to enjoying, you know, sex or good food or drink or whatever, whatever other physical pleasures you want to throw in the, in the, the mix. So you would, if you were Aristippus, you would say, this is a good trade-off. This is rational to do. This makes sense. This is good practical reason. You weigh your pleasures and pains and you decide for the ones that are going to actually bring you the greater amount of pleasure or the less amount of pain. Yeah. I think the fact that he's rich, for lack of a better word, he, Pops he, he can afford to live this philosophy because... I think that played it, a role, yeah. Yeah, I mean, without it, you, you can get by without friends for a while if you have money. Yeah. Without it, I mean, start running out of resources to to afford the pleasures that you that that outweigh the the pain. I think there's something to what you're saying. Yeah, and I think that um, the the amount of pain that you would feel spending the money <coughs> would probably vary too. If you if you have to make a trade-off between Providing for your children or satisfying your, your habit, whatever it is, that's a much bigger thing than <clears throat> using your disposable income that you weren't really going to, you're just going to put in savings on, on that, that thing. It's, it's a much different kind of pain. So I think, you're, I think what you're saying is plausible. I think maybe him being a rich man in the Athens at the time may have had something to do with it. Um, but you do find some people who espouse this kind of philosophy and live it out who, who are poor, they just sacrifice everything for, for physical pleasures. Yeah. I mean, 
Isn't it really just a way to justify what you're doing? Well, yeah. Right. Moral theory ought to be able to do that. Right. You're, but, you're saying he's just rationalizing right, exactly. what he wants to do. So he's, he's like, well, this is what I'm doing. People hate it, well, but this is what's going on. So I'm going to keep doing this kind of deal. Well, that would be, and that would be very similar to, to what you were saying. These would all be sort of explanations of why he put forth this doctrine. We could consider, though, let's say we put that aside. We could think about, does this still make sense even, even if he did that? Could it, could it make sense for somebody else? Could it be a good moral theory? Um, is it, is it, let's say we took Aristippus out of it and I told you that he, or I told you that some poor guy came up with it. We'll call him Oscar the Grouch, you know. Um, and uh, he articulated on Sesame Street for the first time, blah, 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 blah. Um, would it have made any difference to the moral theory itself? No, it, it, these are all interesting historical facts, and it may be that he was just rationalizing his behavior, and it may be, in fact, that a lot of people who who take this on just do it just to rationalize their their desire to indulge themselves. But I think there are some people who actually do believe this, so we're we're, we're looking at it as a a moral theory. There's one other thing I want to I want to hit on with this. Um, if you hold this sort of view. What would happiness be? Um, well, you would want to experience as much physical pleasure, as little physical pain as possible in your life. And here's where we end up with, with kind of an interesting problem. You have a nice meal. <coughs> How long does that pleasure last? About 20 minutes, 30. You eat fast. Yeah. <laughs> I do too, actually, yeah. I don't think so, because like a lot of times when you have a nice meal, the memory uh -huh. is nice to think about. Uh, comes right, but now remember, for Aristippus, He's focused on the physical. physical. You're right. The, the memory of, of the pleasure goes on much longer, and that's why, that's why there's a whole bunch of you know, food people who talk about these meals that they had back in 1960. And, you know, yeah. I don't necessarily think that, well, I could be wrong. I'm just, Go ahead. I know he puts emphasis on physical pleasure. Does he dismiss entirely mental? He doesn't dismiss it entirely, but he, he's, he's always going to say, if you have the choice between a physical pleasure or a mental pleasure, take the physical because it's going to be more intense. Yes, and but once you have experienced that physical pleasure, I think you're always going to have the mental like ripple effect afterwards. Yeah, I mean historically he didn't he didn't think so. He thought that that the, and this may have been a, a um, this may actually have been a peculiarity of this guy that things okay. didn't stick with him that much. Okay, um, and there are some people like that. There are other people who just, you know, they don't seem to be very, very much enjoying something at the time, and then later on they make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the mental pleasure was quite, quite big for them. But let's go back to this. So, if, if we want to live a life, according to Aristippus, of as much physical pleasure as possible, one of the issues with physical pleasure is it has to be repeated over and over and over again. If you want to be continually experiencing <coughs> physical pleasure, you have to be constantly finding ways to be stimulated, don't you? Um, works that way for food, it works that way for drink, or any sort of drug that you were going to take. It works that way for, for sex, it works that way for the pleasures that come with, you know, just physical things like laying in the sun, or sleeping, or getting a massage, um, listening to music, um, you know, turn the music off, you're no longer experiencing the, the, the pleasure anymore, right? So, there's two things that Aristippus says about this. One is, if you were going to follow this sort of lifestyle, you should pack in as much physical pleasure as you possibly can and set your life up so you're not just going to experience it right now. Like, you know, you guys are you know, in, your, in your 20s, right? Um, you would want to structure your life so you're not only going to experience physical pleasure in your 20s, but in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, all the way down the line. Um, so you probably would want to avoid certain physical pleasures. 
You wouldn't want to get hooked on crack or heroin, right? Because uh, that's pretty, or, or meth, you know, any, any of the big three. Because um, then your life is pretty much done. It, it, why do people um, like these things? Because they are intensely pleasurable. They, you know, they, they stimulate the, the pleasure centers of the brain almost immediately. Um, there's reasons why people get hooked on them. Uh, my, I, I, I had a cousin, actually, who tried opium once, and he said, I would never do that again. I said, it was that bad? He said, it was that good. <laughs> that I know that I couldn't trust myself, that if I ever tried it again, I'd be hooked for life. Um, so there are certain things you would avoid. But in general, you would try to structure your life to experience as much as possible. The other thing that Aristippus says is very few people are able to do this. And this might go to the, the having the wealth helps out an awful lot with that, doesn't it? Um, so it may be a very difficult way to, to live things out. Um, maybe people who adopt this don't realize how difficult it would be to actually make it possible. Let's look now at, at Epicurus. Epicurus is taking a, a, a different position. Aristippus is saying physical pleasures, pains, much more intense. Epicurus, he's differing from Aristippus in two really important respects. One is that he says that mental, oops, tab, mental pleasures or pains are much more intense. And he also is saying something, I didn't put this on the board, Aristippus thought that you got pleasure, you got pain, and then there's something in between which is neither pleasure nor pain. It's a sort of a resting state. Epicurus says, no, actually, if you, so if you, for Aristippus, if you take away pain, that doesn't bring pleasure. That just puts you in this resting state. Epicurus says, no, if you actually take away pain, that itself is pleasant. Blessing. So, taking away pain, alleviating pain, a state of not having pain, is itself pleasant. And you know, this makes sense. Think about some physical pleasures. You're really hungry. Think about how good it feels to eat them, right? Um, you're really thirsty. Think about how good it feels to drink. It's not just that the pain goes away. You actually feel a sense of pleasure, don't you? Think about when you're really, really tired. You're strung out. You've been working a lot. You just want to sleep so, so bad. And then you get in bed. Doesn't that feel good? So just to lay down, just to close your eyes for a minute. Um, Maybe Epicurus is right about that. Now, Epicurus, so Epicurus thinks that mental pleasures are more intense. What, what does he mean um, by mental pleasures? The ones that he has in mind are things like learning. You know, when you actually learn something, when you acquire an idea that you yourself find pleasurable, satisfying, engaging, <coughs> You're going to keep thinking about that idea because you like thinking about that idea. You're going to turn it over in your head and look at it from different angles and aspects. And you're going to dig into it. And you're going to learn more and more and more about it. All of you have experienced this, I hope, right? You may not, ethics may not be your cup of tea. Philosophy may not be your cup of tea. But all of you have a major. Are all of you happy with your major? I hope so. If not, maybe pick a different major, right? Because you should study something that you really like. And that's pleasurable. And that is going to stick with you and sustain you for, for a long time. Um, what are some other mental pleasures? Friendship. Yeah. Like Say again? Is comfortability mental? Com comfortability? Yeah. Comfort comfortability? Is that a word? I'm not sure. <laughs> Being comfortable. Being comfortable? Security? Um, Ah, yes, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Greeks had a word for that, that the Epicureans used, ataraxia, not being troubled. Being, being, 
less, yeah, they didn't, use, they didn't talk about being stressed out, not being stressed out. Um, yeah, that's, that's a mental <coughs> point. That's not a physical point. I mean, we have a physical correlate to that. Your body's not being put under any duress or things like that. That doesn't feel that great, except, you know, when you're stopping exercise or stopping, say, running away from somebody <laughs> and you no longer have to run. Um, but the not being troubled by things, not being stressed out by things. Epicurus thinks that's intensely pleasurable. All of you have experienced that, I hope, right? Maybe not so much as students. Not yet. When you've got all your assignments done way in advance, and you're already <coughs> studied for the test, you've got the study sheets ready, that would be what you're talking about. Probably the best thing to think of is when you were like five and you didn't have care in the world. That's you would not be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless you were a kid who got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, yeah, a, a lot of us, when we think back to our childhood, if we had a fairly happy childhood, sometimes even if we blocked out the unhappy parts, um, we think of it as a time when we didn't have responsibilities. I actually, you know, it's, it's interesting. As a professor, I think about when I was a graduate student and I didn't have to be prepared every day and give lectures and grade students, you know, essays and stuff like that. And I just had to write my own papers and read whatever I wanted to read and show up for class and be more or less, you know, prepared. And how carefree my life was, you know. Did I really feel like that back then? I don't, I'm not even sure. You know. Um, maybe we, maybe we, we project that backwards, you know, and reminisce about these times. Um, but you know, if, if you're Epicurus, you'd want to be working for a time like that. You'd want that to be something that you're aiming at. Um, so hopefully, your your majors will actually allow you to live a life that's fairly stress-free. Um, some majors may be tougher to do that than others. Um, so yeah, one other one other pleasure that we could talk about friendship. Friendship is a primarily a mental pleasure um, that can go on lasting actually even beyond the death of the person. You can have good thoughts about them, right? You can remember them fondly. Um, I guess your relationships with your families, with their friendships. Um, so Epicurus thinks that you ought to, if you have to choose one or the other, you want to choose mental pleasures. They last longer, they're more intense. They're also less likely to bring about pains. Um, so let's think about some physical pleasures and some of the pains that they might actually bring about as well. Yeah. Do you say it's less likely to bring about pains like mental pleasures? Because I would think something mental and lasting longer would be much more painful than a mental pleasure would be more painful? Or a mental pain, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about mental pains in a moment. Uh, Epicurus thinks that they do indeed, they're difficult to get rid of. And um, a lot of the Epicurean philosophy that you see in like the principal doctrines is trying to steer you out of some things that cause you mental pain. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that We'll get to that in a moment. Um, you're right. If, men, if mental pleasures are more intense, mental pains are more. Mental pleasures are more lasting, mental pains are more lasting. But let's think about some physical um, pleasures. Think about, um, we'll take two. These will be kind of, you know, funny stock things, of ways people get themselves in trouble. Um, you can think of pains that you have to, or pleasure, pains you have to endure, pleasures that you have to um, forego in order to get a pleasure. You can think of ways the pleasure itself could like go off the rails and not work out the way that you hoped it did. And then you can think of bad consequences, painful consequences that could come with it. So let's take um, getting drunk as, as an example, right? Um, now why do people get drunk? Well, because it's fun. You know, people like, like drinking because um, it makes you know, your body feel a different way and a lot of that's, that's pleasurable, you know. Provided you don't go past a certain limit, then it, then it can feel pretty bad. Um, but you know, the first couple drinks, people are generally having a good time. It makes people more sociable. Um, might lead to adventures of one form or another. You know, um, but what do you have to do generally in order to get get that that drink? What do you have to 
give up as a trade-off. You've got to pay for it, generally, right? In one way or another. I mean, if somebody's giving you free drinks, they're not really free. You, you have to give them something in return, usually, one form or another, right? It might just be passing the time with them. Um, bless you. But you have, to, you have to give something up. And then how could things go wrong when you're out drinking? Before, like, the, the morning after, what are some things that might go wrong just in the moment? Yeah. Can't make like, good decisions. <clears throat> Alcohol does lower your, your, your decision making ability. Uh, yeah. You might get into a fight with somebody. Yeah, or somebody actually might get in a fight with you. You know, somebody else is drunk and you look at them and they think you're looking at them the wrong way. <coughs> you know? um, those, those sort of things happen. Uh, yeah. The blow of money. Yeah, well, yeah that, that can happen at the bar too. Um, suddenly you're buying around for everybody and you didn't realize there were 30 people in the bar. You know? Yeah. Try to spend too much money because when whenever you get drunk, sometimes like you don't think. That's that. Money yeah, that's that decision making ability gets lower, right? Um, maybe the the <coughs> bartender doesn't mix the drinks well, or the, the cups are dirty, and you get sick as a result. You know, uh, or you eat the bar food, and the bar food is, is, you know, hasn't been uh, it's been out there for five hours. You know, since happy hour. Um, who knows? You know, these are all things that could happen. And then, what are what are likely consequences of drinking too much? What, what's the one that you know is going to happen? Hangover. Hangover, right? And hangover is a physical pain, a whole set of physical pains. Some of it's in your stomach, some of it's in your head. Your body is lethargic because alcohol is a poison, and you've, you've in effect poisoned your body to get the the uh, brief charge out of the physical charge out of it. There might be other consequences too. Maybe you did get in a fight and wake up, you know, outside in the gutter. Um, you could wake up in bed next to somebody the next morning, not know who they are, not be happy with who they are. You could wake up and your car is somewhere else. Who knows? You are somewhere else. Yeah, you could you could have been rolled. All sorts of things could, could happen as a, as a result. And most of those are physical pains. Um, there could be some mental pains that result from it, sense of shame. Yeah. One uh, mental will be like losing a friend or something. Oh. Just because you got into a fight with a friend, then yeah. you realize that what you did was wrong, so now you're actually thinking about it. Sure, and, and you feel regret. Um, sometimes uh, a secret will come out when you're drunk that you, you know, said you weren't going to say, and that could ruin a friendship. Um, so, there, you know, drinking alcohol by itself is pleasurable, but it's a pleasure that oftentimes risks being mixed with a lot of pains. Some of them are, are guaranteed to come. I mean, if you drink enough to get drunk, you will have a hangover of one form or, or another, right? Um, it works that way with a lot of other physical pleasures. If you indulge in, in eating too much good food, what happens? Yeah, and then you don't feel good, and you know there's there's diseases that can come with that. You know, have you ever heard of gout? It was a popular disease back in the 18th century because they were eating a lot of meat. Um, it causes intense pain in the legs. Um, and they you know, came from eating somewhat bad meat um, that people got it. Um, up at the culinary, you know, they talk about the freshman 15 here at, at you know, other colleges. It's like the freshman 25 to 30 up there <laughs> because you have to taste all these great dishes. But there's a trade-off with it, right? Um, Physical pleasures often tend to have consequences. And Epicurus talks about this, and he has a way of um, thinking about this. He talks about pleasures that are natural and necessary, pleasures that are natural but not necessary, and then pleasures that are neither necessary nor natural. I realize that's a lot of N words um, all thrown in together, so it's hard to keep them straight. So what are natural and necessary pleasures, he says? Those that if we don't satisfy, we feel a pain, like hunger, right, or thirst, Sex. sexual desire, yeah. Um, although he seems to have been abstinent, more or less. Um, so he seems to have like dealt with that, that problem somehow in his, his garden. Um, not sure how long. <laughs> yeah. Probably not the best word choice. Go ahead. Um, one that would be like, never mind. Go, go ahead. 
necessary or not necessary or natural to be drugs or alcohol. Yeah, and now the interesting thing is some people might say, well, if I don't get my, my drug, I feel awful physical pain. You know, somebody who's addicted to heroin, for example, will in fact feel awful pain. Actually, even if you're just addicted to nicotine, you quit smoking, you're going to feel lousy and you're going to feel cravings that are very intense. Um, Epicurus would call this pain. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, not an, it's not an actual natural thing because there's nothing you know, natural about human beings. It's not part of our nature to, to need to um, smoke. It's something that we eventually did. And we did it because it was pleasant, and then we came to desire it. Um, but you know, if you were an Epicurean, you would probably want to avoid that sort of thing. Um, here's, here's one way of thinking about these things. You, you have to eat, right? If you don't eat, how do you feel? Run down, then, then it starts to hurt. Right? Some of you have fasted, I think, before. Um, and then when you, when you do eat, it feels good. Do you need to eat anything fancy when you're really hungry? Could you eat oatmeal and you'd be okay with it? If you're really hungry? I don't like oatmeal. No, no, no. Yeah. If I'm really hungry, I, I can be okay with oatmeal. Um, that's a natural and necessary pleasure. Eating a, a, a good meal that's cooked the way that you like it, that's natural, but that's not necessary. Rich foods are not necessary. They are something that our nature craves. Do you like sweet stuff? Who doesn't like sweet stuff? Do you like fatty foods? Fat makes food taste good. <coughs> you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. Do you like salty things? Salt makes things taste good too, but we don't actually need that much of that. That's not, it's not necessary in a strict sense. And then when you eat, do you need to eat on gold plates? That's neither necessary nor natural, right? Certainly not natural. Uh, human beings, you know, back in caveman days didn't have plates at all, uh, as far as we know. And they certainly weren't gold plates, and most people don't have gold plates even today. Yeah. Every holiday, really, it just makes me think, what, who started the whole, like, you need a nice plate to eat on for, like... Oh, like China. You mean you need all the fancy plate. China? Yeah, like... Yeah. Yeah, Epicurus would say those are... Those are the kind of things that we probably should do without if we want to live a genuinely pleasant life. Because people get really worked up about that. You know, they allow themselves to feel mental pains over whether they have physical things, uh, whether they're getting access to certain desires that really, you know, don't, don't have anything to do with the good life. Um, let's talk really quickly now about mental pains. Epicurus thinks that the happy life you want to be, you don't want to have physical pains, right? So you, you want to avoid food that's going to give you gout or, you know, a drink that's going to give you a hangover or things like that. Um, you're not going to eat very rich fare. Uh, when it comes to clothing, you don't really need a lot of fancy clothes. Um, I apologize to any, you know, fashion or design majors here. Epicurus is not the guy for you, you know. Aristippus would be the guy for you. Because he'd say, yeah, wear all the fancy stuff you can get your hands on. Um, Epicurus thinks that you, you wouldn't do that sort of thing. And this would be in order to avoid pain. This would be in order to live a rational life where you, you set things up so that you're going to experience as much pleasure and as little pain as possible. But what's really, what really affects us are mental pains. And what are the mental pains that he thinks are, are the worst? He doesn't worry so much about shame or things like that. He thinks about our fears of pain you know, we, you can feel physical pain. If you fear physical pain, that's often worse than the actual physical pain. You guys have probably all experienced that. You know, like when you were a kid and you were scared of the needle that, for the shot or whatever it was that you had, and then they actually pushed it into you. And it hurt, but it wasn't that bad. Fearing that can, can be worse, right? Um, fearing punishment. Why do people fear punishment? Because they do bad things. They do things they shouldn't do. There's, there's a way to avoid that. Don't do bad things. Epicurus um, says, you know, be a just person and withdraw from society and political entanglements as much as possible. Um, what's the biggest fear is, though? He talks about two other ones. And, and this is why study <coughs> and philosophy would be particularly important for the Epicurean. Yeah. Death is one of the big ones. Do you remember the other one? 
the unknown. Um, and, and what he means by that, you know, think about ancient Greek times. They didn't know what caused thunder or lightning or hurricanes or stuff like that. So they would attribute them to the gods. And the gods seemed to be kind of random in, in that. And so you couldn't really depend on them not to screw you over. And so that's something to, to worry about. That's why he, he begins the principal doctrines by saying, gods aren't concerned with, with us. Don't worry about that sort of thing. He's actually a materialist. So he thinks that there isn't any afterlife. Um, this is it. And this goes to how, how he answers the, the issue of death. If, if one of the things that you're worried about is your own death, I don't think this is going to work very well for other people's deaths, if those concern you, which they probably do, right? But if, at least for your own death, why don't you have to worry about that for Epicurus? Yeah? There's no feeling that comes with it. Because you no longer have a body, there's nothing to feel. Yeah, when you're dead, there's no, there's no you. There's no experience of death. We experience other people dying. We don't experience our own death. So there's nothing to actually fear, he thinks. Um, I, I'm not sure I buy that myself. You were going to raise your hand. Um, it's just, it is entirely unknown to even people that think they know it. So it's the most logical reason. So there can't be a way that he confuses himself to go his life. Yeah, if, if we shouldn't <laughs> fear the unknown, then I guess death would also fit into that. You know what I fear about um, when it comes to my own death? is not actually any bad things for me. It's bad things for my kids. Um, and that does actually keep me up at night. And that's why, you know, life insurance is a good idea to have, right? Um, so maybe Epicurus can't address all of this. But at least you, you do see what he can address. This is a coherent moral theory, this, this hedonistic approach. And you notice that Epicurus and Aristippus Two very different interpretations of it, right? Um, it, being a hedonist doesn't necessarily mean being committed to a life of physical pleasure and forget all mental cultivation. You know, I, I often pose this in terms of beer or books. You know, uh, which is which is the pleasant life? Uh, maybe it's maybe it's both. Of them, but Epicurus would definitely say the books. Aristippus would, de would definitely say the beer. And that's that's what we're going to leave off for today. Um, see all of you on uh, Friday.